मेरे सपनों को जाने का हक रे मेरे सपनों को जाने का हक रे क्यों सदियों से टूट रहे हैं इन्हें सजने का नाम नहीं मेरे हाथों को ये जाने का हक रे मेरे हाथों को ये जाने का हक रे क्यों बरसों से खाली पड़े हैं इन्हें आज भी काम नहीं क्यों बरसों से खाली पड़े हैं इन्हें आज भी काम नहीं मेरे पैरों को ये जाने का हक रे मेरे पैरों को ये जाने का हक रे क्यों गांव गांव चलना पड़े रे क्यों बस का निशान नहीं क्यों गांव गांव चलना पड़े रे निशान नहीं मेरी भूख को ये जाने का हक रे मेरी भूख को ये जाने का हक रे तू गोदामों में सड़ते हैं दाने मुझे मुठी भर धान नहीं क्यों गोदामों में सड़ते हैं दाने मुझे मुठी भर धान मेरी बूढ़ी माँ को जाने का हक रे मेरी बूढ़ी माँ को जाने का हक रे क्यों गोली नहीं सुई दवा खाने पट्टी टांके का सामान नहीं क्यों गोली नहीं सुई दवा खाने पट्टी टांके का सामान नहीं मेरे बच्चों को ये जाने का हक रे मेरे बच्चों को ये जाने का हक रे क्यों रात दिन करे मजदूरी क्यों शाला मेरे गांव नहीं क्यों रात दिन करे मजदूरी क्यों शाला मेरे गांव नहीं मेरे खेतों को ये जाने का हक रे मेरे खेतों को ये जाने का हक रे क्यों बांध बने रे बड़े बड़े क्यों फसलों में जान नहीं क्यों बांध बने रे बड़े बड़े क्यों फसलों में जान नहीं मेरी नदियों को जाने का हक रे मेरी नदियों को जाने का हक रे क्यों जहर मिलाए कारखाने जैसे नदियों में जान नहीं क्यों जहर मिलाए कारखाने जैसे नदियों को डालियां वो पत्ते तने मिट्टी क्यों झरनों का नाम नहीं कहा डालिया वो पत्ते तने मिट्टी क्यों झरनों का नाम नहीं मेरे गांव को ये जाने का हक रे मेरे गांव को ये जाने का हक रे क्यों बिजली न सड़के न पानी खुले राशन की दुकान नहीं क्यों बिजली न सड़के न पानी खुले राशन की दुकान नहीं मेरी बस्तियों को जाने का हक रे मेरी बस्तियों को जाने का हक रे क्यों बसे हुए घर को उजाड़े रहे नाम निशान नहीं क्यों बचे हुए घर को उजाड़े रहे नाम निशान नहीं मेरे वोटों को ये जाने का हक रे मेरे वोटों को ये जाने का हक रे क्यों एक 
एक दिन बड़े बड़े वादे फिर पांच साल काम नहीं क्यों एक दिन बड़े बड़े वादे फिर पांच साल काम नहीं मेरे राम को ये जानने का हक रे रहमान को ये जानने का हक रे क्यों खून बहिर सड़कों पे क्या सब इंसान नहीं क्यों खून बहर सड़कों पे क्या सब इंसान नहीं मेरी जिंदगी को जीने का हक रे मेरी जिंदगी को जीने का हक रे अब हक के बिना भी क्या जीना ये जीने के समान नहीं अब हर के बिना भी क्या जीना ये जीने के समान नहीं अब हक के बिना भी क्या जीना ये जीने के समान नहीं क्यों सुई नहीं गोली दवा खाने पट्टी टांके का समान नहीं क्यों जहर मिलाए कारखाने Uh, in the last month and a half I've been here, many of you are your friends. 
and I'm going to be very informal and hardly a formal person, so you'll forgive me if I treat you all as old friends. <laughs> so I'll not treat you as people I've met today. And in one sense, I think the world is very small if we see each other as human beings. And if we see each other as white and black and brown and this nation and the other, we are very different indeed. So I'm going to uh, talk today about culture and democracy because I'm very interested in this intersection because many of the things that divide us today and many of the things that actually bring us together coexist. But it depends on what we want to perceive. In my language, one of the many Indian languages that is Hindi, there is a saying that says that if you want to, you're my family. If I don't want to, you're my enemy. It's a fine line dividing perception of people, perception of issues, and perception of politics, and perception of democracy. Because democracy, unfortunately, is not one. We have so many interpretations of democracy, so many misuse, many kinds of misuse of democracy. And of course, I don't know if it's a common word used anywhere else, but we call this majoritarianism in India, where a majority misuses its authority, even though it's elected to power to go against the principles and norms of basic fundamental constitutional values that we are uh, guaranteed. So what you saw in that small clip was a film made of, a, of, of the convention that was held in 2004 of the National Campaign for People's Right to Information. And the thousand people, odd people you saw in the auditorium of the uh, arts faculty of the Delhi University, where we house this convention. They're all makers of the law. The law was not made by one individual, it was made by a multiplicity of groups, of different kinds of people, who gave different kinds of ideas. But the consistent battle on the streets was fought by the Mazdur Kisan Shakti Samitra and the National Campaign for People's Right to Information. But with them alone, nothing could have happened. There was the support and the persistent, consistent support of people who brought in very special skills to the battle, brought in legal expertise, brought in the media. We had four huge names and figures of the Indian media, print media with us. They are no longer alive, any of them. One of them is alive, Kudip Nayar is alive, he's over 90. But I don't know how many of you know anything uh, about India in an immediate sense, but I see some friends who know more than I do. So, well, I'll mention the names because I think it's worth mentioning. Ajit Bhattacharya, who used to be the editor of the Indian Express, the Times of India, and at the time of the campaign was the director of the Press Institute of India. There was Nikhil Chakravarti, the biggest name in Indian journalism, ethical journalism, who refused awards, who returned awards, and who was uh, part of a big institution called the Prasad Bharati, who was the most deeply respected Indian journalist in the last 40 years. Then we had Prabhat Joshi, the first great Hindi journalist, who set up the basis of regional language journalism, not regional, but language journalism, and was a very powerful political figure. And then we had Kuldeep Nair, all there with the campaign from the word go. So you really had huge big names associated with us. We had people from politics, from political parties. We had people from the bureaucracy, the much maligned bureaucracy, which I still malign quite happily. But <laughs> there were people from the bureaucracy who helped us. And there were people from everywhere, people from public life. Uh, so. What you saw in that film, which uh, this beautiful song that Binay and Charu uh, wrote, is now like the anthem for the RTI campaign, because it brings in not only the concept of the law, but how this law can be used in a democracy for various things. In the beginning when the campaign began, nobody understood what the hell it meant. You know, what is this right to information about? We are dying of hunger, we are dying of poverty, we are dying of this, that, and the other, of communal. In India, communal means conflict between communities. So there's conflict between communities, and you come here and talk about the right to information, it makes no sense to anybody. So the interpretation of the right to information as being vital to the survival and the ethics, the well-being, and the dignity of all individuals in India came through with that song and in these simple couplets. It tells you how to fight hunger, 
how to fight anything that you have in India, environmental degradation, of snatching of rights, of, of the onslaught of the new development paradigm, of the way religion is being used now to divide us, every single thing is in that song. It was a remarkable song. And John and Rene continued to make songs for us. And they uh, recently brought out an album called Azadi, which is the much maligned word post JNU. As you know, because after, after Azadi, I don't know how many of you know about the JNU conflict. How many of you do? Fair number do. So anyway, so the JNU, the Azadi slogan became the reason for a lot of angst by the present government, but uh, they brought out an album called Azadi. What does Azadi freedom mean to all of us? So anyway, the intersections between culture and democracy, uh, for me, culture is what really unites us. I want to begin with some anecdotes. Culture unites us. It looks at things across, across borders. If I sing Mast Kalandar, no one's going to think, am I a Pakistani? Am I a Bangladeshi? Am I an Indian? But Mast Kalandar belongs to the South Asian subcontinent. Everybody sings Mast Kalandar. So when I went to the Fairs Festival, I didn't feel I was from another country. Because they were singing the songs I knew. <laughs> if I was a North Indian, I knew Mast Kalandar. It's a Sufi song, beautiful song. It's been sung by Vida, it's been sung by Nayara, it's been sung by Anwar Khan Manganiyar, it's been sung by so many people across the across the border of the So in a sense, culture unites. But the moment you think about something else, you divide. So democracy is both what unites us and what divides us. And it's, that's, the, that's the intersection where I think the right to information campaign really grew from the strengths of the intersection. It used song, it used theater, and it also used the areas of overlap. And we coined a new phrase at that time called limited engagement. We called it the non-negotiables. There's few non-negotiables on which we all agree. Then we can disagree. Because when you fine tune something, we disagree violently in India. We argue endlessly. That's why Amartya Sen wrote about the argument into India. We can't stop. <laughs> Even when we agree, we disagree. That's the, that's the temperament of the Indian. So we argue all the time. But the point is when you have a set of simple non-negotiables, and you agree, it was fact that you needed the transparency of government records for your right to life. So we had two simple slogans. One was the right to know, the right to live. Jan ne ka haq, ji ne ka haq. So if you didn't know, not if you didn't know information, you couldn't survive at many levels. So it was a vital right. And the second one was coined by my friend Sushila, passed her class four exam. She's a fantastic woman. And she came with us to Delhi in 1996 when we had a huge press conference attended by BB Singh, Justice Sawan, and all the doyens of people who have supported right to information. And so she was there, and the press said, oh, What the hell are you doing here? I mean, they asked her in Hindi uh, or Urdu, Thora Bot. How much have you studied? She said, Class 4. They said, Are, what are you doing here? What do you know about the right to information law? And it's too complicated and too esoteric for someone like you. She said, really? Then she answered them. She said, when I send my son the 10 rupees to the marketplace, when he comes back, I ask for accounts. The government spends billions of rupees in my name. You may say, I won't ask for accounts. And she said in Hindi, Urdu too, Hamara paisa, Hamara hisab. Our money, our accounts. And I was absolutely thunderstruck because I, I talked for half an hour about it. She said it in two minutes. She encapsulated the idea of the right to information. So it was people like this with the slogans and the theatrical uh, outpourings and the culture that we reached out to people. Because when you go with dry words, people don't listen to you after time. It's very boring. You know, you've heard it. And there's a drone. And most people are lulled to sleep. So, we need a theater culture and also the different modes of communicating ideas. Today, I went to a fantastic concert. I went to the Orchestra of the Symphony Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> and I went there to listen to classical music. You might say, what is this woman who's supposed to sit on the streets of India and fight for her rights? Why should she listen to classical music? But I love it. 
and I've listened to music since I was very young. So why not? So this is the only indulgence I have when I come out of India, <laughs> that I listen to things I can't there. So at this special, special performance was for the elderly. I don't know if you all know. And at 10 30 in the morning, people with gray hair, I mean, all of us, but for a few, had gray hair. And we were sitting there listening to Kokofia, and we were listening to Bojak, and we had, I, I just enjoyed my music. Because music breaks down all barriers. Sound is pure. It doesn't say you're Indian or Pakistani, Bangladeshi. It doesn't say you're European or non European. It just takes you into a different level of understanding and beauty where you all feel united. And I was absolutely uplifted by that. I came out, it was raining, and I wanted to hail a taxi. <laughs> and I didn't know how. <laughs> and I was stopped, absolutely trapped in my differences, in my being an Indian, in Montreal without French, not understanding what happened in Montreal, how you order a taxi. And then my difference was so obvious. And someone who saw me would have said, oh, she's an elderly woman who doesn't know what to do with her life floundering around, which is true. But that's not all of me. But that's a part of me in the foreign country. <laughs> so in a sense, I wanted to say this because we have to understand that democracy takes its place. Culture brings us together and then we have all the uncomfortable questions about Kashmir today. What's happening in Kashmir? It's not a question of just Pakistan and India. It's a question for the world. What is being done to Kashmiris today in India? is a matter of concern for all of us, and then we may have very different opinions. So we have situations where we are one and we are not one. When I came back in the taxi, finally I got home, I came back in the taxi. I sat down, and there was this Algerian taxi driver, and he was listening to classical music, and I said, oh, you like classical music? He said, well, that's what I listen to most of the time. And then uh, I said to him, do you know that Bob Dylan has actually got the Nobel. He said, I'm so happy he's got the Nobel. And I said, you echo my thoughts, because I am a woman who knew the politics of the 60s. And what Bob Dylan meant to us then was not just as a lyricist. He was the voice of young people protesting against the oppression of the state. So for me, embodies very many different things. And I was also so happy, because I got a message on my phone saying, imagine Bob Dylan's got the Nobel for literature. Wonderful! And then I thought of my brother when I was uh, when I was already working when Bob Dylan did the scene, and my brother insisted that I listen to him, and I was to think, of this harmonica waving away and his pitched voice, and what is it saying to me? And then he used to say to me, No, 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 that's all right, but you have to listen to the lyrics. And when I heard the lyrics, I was converted, and then I started liking that music, which was very different. In the mess that South Asia is today, terrible mess, and we can't deny it, because we're all pitching for war on either side, we're trying to look at the most negative things we're trying to look And in the middle of this, we want democracy to survive, we want it to survive with dignity, we want it to deliver to everybody, and we have this marauding capitalism that's come to India, and even, <coughs> if, even the Pope who went to South America said that marauding capitalism is like the dunk of the devil. It's not only me. So if this is the dunk of the devil, then we'll have to do something about removing the dunk. We don't want marauding capitalism. We want better. What we want, we'll have to see. We get trapped in these concepts and ideas. We are so reactive when somebody says he's a capitalist, somebody's back goes up, somebody says socialist, then you can't even mention it. You can't mention you're a feminist, you can't mention but all these categories are useful up to a certain extent and we have to use them. But they can't bind us. So what these campaigns for right to information and NGNRG did to all of us is take away all this uh, verbiage and it is directly to the facts and to the essence of all the rights that I enshrined for us in the Indian constitution. Took us straight to the chapter on fundamental rights and the chapter on the directive principles of state policy which clearly enunciated through the words of Dr. Ambedkar that we also needed to establish economic and social rights. And if economic and social rights are denied to you through a system of governance which, is, which says one thing and does another, which is all the time biased in favor of the rich or the well-off or the powerful, which uses corruption 
and uses arbitrary use of power as the facade and the smoke screen behind which it can do anything to you, turn you upside down, inside out, and you don't know what's happening, then we need to get to know what it's doing inside because after all, democracy has guaranteed to us as voters the fundamental right to govern ourselves. It's not merely the casting of a vote and getting a representative into parliament. It has given me the right to question parliament to understand. So what did the Right to Information actually do? It dealt with and engaged with a culture of secrecy. Because secrecy is not only with the confines of the government offices. Culture of secrecy is part of every country, including the US or Canada or everywhere. I find that even I here ask too many difficult questions. So <laughs> questioning anybody is a problem. And the receiving of questions has to begin in our heads. And we have to understand that there is privacy. There is, of course, absolute right to privacy. But there is general information which must be shared if we call ourselves a democracy. And I think that's a fundamental right. So in this battle for getting that right, if the first thrust was from local people, from ordinary people. So I believe today, and I keep saying it even in my class, some of my students are here, friends are here, that it's the poor in India who kept democracy going. Because for them, it's a system that has to survive for their well-being. They can't afford to think of anything else. Because that vote, however, however you may see the vote, for them, it's a vital link between what they are and what the government is and what the state is and what it will deliver to them. They see the link and they think they at least have a right to go and ask a few questions, otherwise they don't. But that hasn't been sufficient. The standing committees of parliament are arbitrary. The speaker may or may not set up a standing committee in the legislation. The standing committees are committees set up in parliament for examining legislations. But that's also arbitrary because the speaker, if she or he does not want to start a process of a standing committee or a select committee, that doesn't exist. So if you have to discuss your legislations, your laws, your well-being, your budgets, the, how much money comes to rural India or not to some other group, or how your schools are going to run, how your water supply is going to be, whether gas needs subsidy, whether you need to uh, have a unique identification device to establish that you're an Indian, or can't you be an Indian without the unique identification device, Millions of questions that the people want to ask is now legitimized after the right to information. Before this, we were just sent straight to prison or disregarded completely. And if I asked her any question, they'd say she's a Maoist. That's why she's asking this. She lives in a village, she lives in a mud hut, mud hut. So she is a Maoist. So you can disregard her. And I must, towards the end, show you my mud hut, where I live partly. So you live in a mud hut or a Maoist. Simple equation. You fight for land, you're a Maoist. You talk about agricultural equality, you're a Maoist. But today they can't do it. They can't put me away on the simple excuse that I'm a Maoist because right to information has proved my legitimacy to question. The question that I ask is in the public domain. Anybody can see that question. And anybody can see the answers to that particular question. So you can't damn me so easily. Culture takes a lot of doing to change. The culture of questioning is fundamentally an unequal culture. If you are aware, you have the culture of secrecy, it's an unequal culture. And all our cultures want to maintain that inequality because of power. Because unless you have this inequality, you cannot have the power to control people, to spread rumors, to, uh, to talk unscientifically, irrationally, to confuse the people, to bring in orthodoxy and faith with, without rationality. I don't think that all, all faith or all orthodoxy is without reason. But I do certainly think that a part of it is without reason. So if you question that part, you're immediately a heretic today in my country. If you say anything, there's the social media which comes and attacks you. There's social attacks on you. You as a woman cannot say anything. You as a Dalit cannot say anything. As a non-Hindu, you can't say anything. So they have honed in on the right to freedom of expression because Article 19 of the Indian Constitution from which the right to information was born is now under attack. The moment you take away the right to information, uh, the, the uh, right to freedom of expression, there is no right to information. Information flows from that. All democratic rights flow from the right to freedom of expression 
And in my country, it's under attack, and it's frightening. Because you can't eat what you want, you can't dress how you like, you can't express an opinion. If you're within the university, whether it's Hyderabad or the JNU, then you're under attack. So it is, for me, a very frightening thing. And we cling on to the right to information as the one line of rationality between us and the state today. And you don't know how much it means to us. There are more than 8 million users every year of the right to information in India. I know 8 million to India is a small figure. <laughs> 1.2 billion. But nevertheless, 8 million is 8 million. So we have 8 million users of the right to information. And you have in the MGNREGA, the biggest works program in the world ever. You have 29 million workers at the height of its success. There were 29 million workers in India getting work for 100, not for 100 days, they got it for less days, but they all got work and they all got the right to ask for the minimum wage, which is the lowest amount of money an agricultural worker can be made. The government of India had to spend 1 billion rupees on the NRGA. Now, this has completely been unacceptable to the powers that be. So they have attacked the rights based legislation, legislations. They have attacked the NRGA. The Prime Minister made a statement in Parliament saying that I'll keep it alive as a monument to the failure of the previous government. But he could not do what he prophesied he'd do because he was under attack even by his own party in rural India. For the first time in the history of the economics of India, money has come to rural India and we have spent it better than it was spent before. At least we now know money has come. Before this, as Rajiv Gandhi said when he was Prime Minister, you send one rupee and only 15 paisa reaches the village. 15%, but I think even less reached. Because sometimes the rupee was sent and we didn't know it had come at all. With the right to information, the, the, no, the information that money is coming into rural villages, and now with the NGNRG, it strengthens to systems which have been put into the government, like the social audit process where information has to be shared with people, where there are public audits, public audits are compulsory wherever you have a rural employment guarantee program, where information has to be painted on the walls. And so information is painted in Rajasthan, for instance, on every wall we have more than 100,000 walls painted with information. They're all yellow walls. So when you go into a village, you can easily identify, ah, there's a government wall, you know. So information that used to be on MISs have now become transferred to GISs. What is a GIS? We call it the Janta Information System. Because not everyone in India has access to the internet or computers. So how do you get the information? So we transfer the information there. It is truly a democratic process and when we fight for it, we are not looking at who is what religion, what community, and we are therefore fighting together for what is really basic democratic rights. And that's why Jean Dres and I and many others in India fought for universalization for all rights. We said do not divide these rights. Don't say, I don't know how many of you know about the Indian economic system, the below poverty line. We said we don't want to be a below poverty line, which is itself a corrupt make a way to corrupt the system, have universal. Universal and people will eliminate themselves if they don't need it. So we've been fighting for all kinds of systemic change and therefore I feel that culture binds us together and in rural communities they know it. So whether it is Eid or whether it is Diwali, we all greet each other. Festivals are important and I'm not, I'm an agnostic. But even for me, it's been extremely important to celebrate these festivals, not in its religious aspect, but to meet people. And it's the acknowledging the other. So no matter whether I am anything or not, I was born in a Hindu family. So it's important for me on Eid to be seen with my Muslim friends, not because they think I am anything less or more than what I am, but I must be seen with them, I must acknowledge them. For those who have faith, I have to be there in their faith. Not that I believe in it. Similarly with my Hindu friends, I have to be seen with them on days in which they celebrate their festivals. I may or may not believe in them. So it's brought to me how religion and culture are intermixed. I married into Bengal and I know that in Bengal, Everything dissolves when there's pujo. 
Guru is so important, it doesn't matter what politics you are, it doesn't matter what you are, but Guru is Guru. So like that, if you take ex extrapolate that into the rest of India, there are these things. So I have been forced at every juncture in my life to have another look at whatever I believe in, believed in and believe today. Nothing is permanently ensconced in my mind except my principles. I won't let go of my principles. But how I perceive a problem has been forced on me by my friends. Some figures, quickly, if you are interested in them, I think some people like figures, so I brought figures a lot. <laughs> in case you think I'm just bullshitting. <laughs> So, 33% uh, of all rural households worked under the NRDG. That's a huge number. I told you 6.9 million workers on 4.6 million work sites. All mapped out. See, on the MIS of the Rural Works Program, which now this present government wants to change. We are fighting another battle, trying to prevent them from tampering with the MIS. There is one slogan, Garf Se Kao Hum Hindustani Hai. Okay. It is written by the right wing people in India. I feel, I am also proud of being an Indian. I haven't changed my nationality. I haven't immigrated. I am still there by taking away. But friend, what I am proud of about India is very different from what you are proud of. <laughs> so let's make that sort of subtext quite clear. I am very proud of the fact that so many millions of Indians are working. I am so proud of the fact that India has given space to this program. I am so proud of the fact that information is out and we have lost 50 people. The 50 people have been killed because of asking for information, vital and critical information. They are still continuing to fight. These are aspects which make me very proud that we fought for the Food Security Act, that we fought for the Forest Act. These things are things that make me proud because these are indigenous things. So you talk about make in India, but you are not proud of the ideas that are born in India. There you want to import to the World Bank. So that seems to be me, to me a very bizarre contradiction. You can wear Indian clothes, you can go to temples or mosques or whatever, but you don't want an Indian idea to flourish. And this is India's contribution to the world. Stiglitz, when he came to recently to Bangalore, by the way, Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize winner, as you all know. So he won it for economics and he came to India and he said the NREGA is the only program in the world which has looked at poverty from the people's point of view and has addressed it. And in fact it is. So when people design things, they design it with practicality and with wisdom. And it's this wisdom that's critical. Now if you want to know more things, I can tell you that 274.7 million persons are Dalits who uh, work there, that's 15% of them, and 52% of all workers are women on these websites. 96 million bank accounts have been opened, which now are claimed to be open as a new government, but they were already opened in the previous government, because NRG money is transferred only through bank accounts. So with all these figures, I must now shift back to poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't leave it with just statistics, because I feel it's this swing between the building blocks, which I keep talking about in my class, and the organic nature of life, that democracy exists. Democracy doesn't exist in a void somewhere, just with a vote, with every five years you go to a voting booth. For me, that's not democracy. For me, democracy is the promise of equality, it's the promise of fraternity, it's the promise of liberty, it's the promise of a just society, it's the promise of dignity, so I'm going to end very quickly with some, quickly with some poems which I'll leave you and then I'm going to leave time for questions. I don't know if I've spoken too long. Have I? No. Don't think no. I won't really talk, have time for questions and answers. I really believe that if one keeps talking for long, I take you where I want to take you. I don't know where you want to go. And it's a journey together today. So this is Bob Dylan. I saw a highway of diamonds with nobody on it. I saw a black branch with blood that kept dripping. I saw a room full of men with their hammers and bleeding. I saw a white ladder all covered with water. I saw 10,000 talkers whose tongues were all broken. I saw guns and sharp swords in the hands of young children. And it's a hard, and it's a hard, it's a hard, 
it's a hard, it's a hard rain is going to fall. Today in the USA, it's true. You know what's happening to African Americans. You know how much that's going on. And the question that keeps popping up in our minds is, have things really changed? They have and they haven't. And that's where, where the haven't appears that you young people have to really think hard because my days are gone. I also treasure the most beautiful lines of Rabindranath Tagore, which are the most oft-quoted, overdone. Uh, in, in Bengali, Shandeep can say it in Bengali, I can't because my mother tongue is Tamil. But anyway, the thing is that these lines haunt us. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, we have, you know, we have intellectual property rights. <laughs> where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out of the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit. In India, we are reasoning that the first plastic surgery took place when my Ganesh got his head of the <laughs> Where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. So the freedom of a nation was extraordinary imagination, was the idea of universality, but with the local people having the right to self-decide about issues that go within their realm. So if Tagore appears to me in the NREG, don't blame me, because I see that most of what is here has come through in the NREG, this principle, this thought, this poetry, transformed into a program where people could do what they want, get money, and survive. I'm going to then talk to anyone who knows Hindustani, Hindi, Urdu, and his songs have been sung, and I went to Pakistan four times, and I've heard Nayara Noor sing, and for me, she is one of the most beautiful singers. And so beautifully, she sang Fez, and for me, Fez is uh, some of the best that's happened in the South Asian uh, region. So I'll read his A Prison Evening, and this is for all prisons everywhere. And we live in prisons in democracy. The prison might be the Armed Forces Special Powers Act imposed in India on Manipur, on JNK. It might be in the Northeast. It might be the hegemony of an upper caste which kills people in a Dalit area. We create these prisons. There are prisons in which the state puts us in, but they're self-created prisons. So let me read this. It star a rum, night comes down the spiral staircase of the evening. The breeze passes by so very close as if someone just happened to speak of love. In the courtyard, the trees are absorbed refugees embroidering maps of return on the sky. On the roof, the moon, loving generously, is turning the stars into a dust of sheen. From every corner, dark green shadows and ripples come towards me. At any moment, they may break over me like the waves of pain. Each time I remember the separation from my love. This thought keeps Consoling me, the tyrants may command that lamps be smashed in rooms where lovers are destined to meet. They cannot snuff out the moon. So today, no tomorrow. No tyranny will succeed. No poison of torture make me bitter. If just one evening in prison can be so strangely sweet. If just one moment anywhere on this earth. So, whether it's Bhagat Singh's words in India, or whether it's Fares' words, or it's Poetry everywhere. It's this kind of poetry that brings us hope and etches the possibility of something happening at the worst possible times. And for people like us who are activists, such thoughts are really important and they're important for everybody. Then I come to the South American continent and one of my favorite writers today, Eduardo Galeano, Aliano, Haliano. Brilliant man. And I discovered him in 2004 when I went to a democracy debate in Barcelona. And I heard this man speak. And I just was transported like I was transported this morning by the music. 
I was transported by Galeano, Galeano's words, and I said, who's this man? They said, you don't know him. I said, no. And they said, it's Edward Warrior. Ever since then, I've read many things he's written. I read every snippet about him, and I think he has this extraordinary capacity of not being in a box. He fights for the poor, but he refuses to be boxed in anything. And if you read him, you will know why I've said this, but I'm going to read what now relates to the future and to ourselves, to climate change, to pollution, to all the various things we live in, and this strange word, world where we are promised this 8.5% this growth that we land in a new world with everything assured for us. But there's a, another writer whom I'm not quoting, please don't get worried, called Mon Biot, who writes for The Guardian, who tells you mathematically why none of these things are possible and why all this mathematics is just camouflaged. And I now remember a book I read when I was in, as an undergraduate student of literature called How to Lie with Statistics. It's a penguin, and it is a statistician telling you how exactly you can lie with it and how you can be selective about what you choose. So anyway, look at this beautiful irony. The air shall be cleansed of all poisons except those born of human fears and human passions. In the streets, cars shall be run over by dogs. People shall not be driven by cars or programmed by computers or bought by supermarkets or watched by televisions. Where were we watched by televisions? In 1984. The famous book by George Orwell. When there were these CCTVs, he didn't call it that. But we watched what we were doing and reported them straight to Big Brother. Have you read 1984? Yeah? So you know what I'm saying. The TV set shall no longer be the most important member of the family. I love this line. The TV set shall no longer be the most important member of the family. It shall be treated like an iron or a washing machine. <laughs> People shall work for a living instead of living for work. And written into law shall be the crime of stupidity. Committed by those who live to have or to win. Instead of living just to live like the bird that sings without knowing it and the child who plays unaware that he or she is playing. In no country shall young men who refuse to go to war go to jail, rather only those who want to make war. So in a sense, Bob Dylan, and he said the same thing, because after all, Bob Dylan and his generation of Americans, uh, of US citizens, fought against conscription in the army and of what happened in Vietnam. In the end, I go to Europe again, because I must at least cover some of my old loves, so I've gone to Yates, but I'm just bringing in a few lines here and there. That I, being poor, have only my dreams. I've spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. Isn't this what we say when we vote with hope every time people to power and hope that they are going to tread softly on our dreams? And they pull them apart, they rip them apart, and they give us nightmares. So for me, this line is not just poetry. It's gone somewhere. It's what happens in a democracy. Every time there's a new election, I say, ah, oh, how are we going to change the government? We're going to this one. The same thing happened again. Education is not the filling of a pail, but rather the lighting of a fire. So how much information can anyone feed into you? But if they feed with desire to know, you go a long way. So, and if there's a desire for knowledge, the desire for truth, the desire to know what is right or what's wrong, the desire to be clear and fair, even with oneself, as we are with others, to acknowledge that we have said something which is not right. It was Gandhi's greatest gift to us, that when he did something wrong, he publicly acknowledged that he had made a mistake. And say my glory was I had such friends. It's been greatly disvalued now. We only have friends because they serve a purpose. I don't know if genuine friendship really lasts in the world now. I know Samia is very upset by my statement because she has good <laughs> friends. But I'm not talking of friends you make in class. I'm talking about the friends we make elsewhere. We always think of is oh I'm breaking into Hindi. May I break into Hindi? Yeah. If I make friends with this guy or woman. What will I get out of it, is the first thought. There are no strangers here, only friends you haven't met. That defines me and you today. 
You are only my friends. You are my friends. We are not strangers. Only we haven't met before. Do not wait to strike till the iron is hot, but make it hot by striking. And that's what we activists are. Because we get together, we listen to people, and we strike. Right to information in the MGNRAG chose its moments, and they chose them well. At a point when elections were being held, the point when for political parties were making commitments, they went to them, and they issued a document called, the first UPA issued a document called, the National Common Minimum Program, making open commitment to the people of India that they give us MGNRGA and the right to information. And we got hold of that. And we said, now accountability. You have said something, you just have to do it. So that's, that's the kind of life I lead where I wait for these moments and strike. And the last thing is, think like a wise man that communicates in the language of the people and that's what democracy demands of us. If we become too esoteric, we become too theoretical, too refined, we pass, they, we just get, we flow over the heads of people. The problem is that the people who have beautiful thoughts are not looking at the idiom. And those who look at the idiom couldn't care less about anything else, like our friend on the other side of the border, Mr. Trump. <laughs> he appeals to everybody because he's using catchy words and phrases and all that. But what behind that? What behind that facade? So those of us who want to communicate today will have to look at our idiom. Are we speaking in the language of the people? Are we using the idiom they understand? And how? And that idiom expands beyond words, expands into song and theater and poetry and what makes them come together. And lastly, but not least, my friend Shankar, they had been here, you would have all been laughing and totally involved, and I have not done anything you would have done, where he takes theater to the streets, stands there, and within two minutes, you have 200 people. Within another 15 minutes, you have 500 people. And so we can get them together with song, with theater, and then make our political comments and get responses from them in their own idiom. Now, that was a vital part of these campaigns. It has taught me that I have to be simple, that I have to communicate. And for my communication, I can't show off my knowledge. That's not, that's not relevant. I may or may not be knowledgeable. That's, of course, another different issue. But to communicate with my people, I have to talk in their idiom, in their language, and with the simplicity that they have in me. I'm in the simplicity of a Lal Singh who went to a th training program, and they always invite us, and I take few people, and this time we went five of us. They invited two, we were five. You're we very lucky that none of the MKSS people are hanging around here. Otherwise, we would have had me plus another four. So, so uh, Lal Singh, by the time they were finished, come on, three, three minutes. They said, oh, 10 minutes. Oof. Lunch time and you're still talking. So I'll see what happened. He said, No, no, I'll say what I have to say in three minutes. He was prepared. He was, they just come from a sit, sit down strike. He was wrapped in one of those carpets we put on the floor, which we call Dari's in, in Rajasthan in India. Uh, striped, thick stuff, which he wrapped around. It was freezing cold. Rajasthan is two, drops to one in winter, and we don't have heating, of course. So he went there and he said, give me three minutes. He said, they said, we'll give you three minutes. He said, give me just one minute and then I'll say it. But if you don't mind, I'll repeat it in my uh, broken Urdu or good Hindi and then you can. May I say it in uh, the language in which he spoke first? Yeah. He said, mujhe teen minute nahi chahiye, mujhe ek minute mein apne baat He said, hum sochte hai ki hume suchna ka adhikar nahi mile, to kya hum jiyenge ya nahi jiyenge? आप सोचते हैं कि सूचना का अधिकार मिल जाए तो क्या आपकी कुर्सी रहेगी या नहीं <laughs> मगर दोस्तों हम सबको मिलकर सोचना चाहिए कि क्या ये देश या दुनिया रहेगा या नहीं रहेगा ब्रिलियंट सो इन दैट वन मिनट ही एनकैप्सुलेटेड द एंटायर एसेंस एंड फिलोसफी ऑफ द राइट नेशन इन ट्रांसलेशन ही सेड वी फील दैट इफ वी डोंट गेट द राइट इंफॉर्मेशन we will not survive. He pointed to the prospective bureaucrats and civil servants and said, you're afraid that if the right to information is given, your power will be dismantled. Then he said, but friends, 
what we have to worry about is without the right to information, whether this nation and the world will survive or not survive. And I said to Nasiji, should be given the biggest order in this country. <laughs> How did you think of it? And of course, because it went on the net, this sentence, this couplet, these three sentences went on the net. And I was invited somewhere to deliver a lecture at the Zafir Hussain College in Delhi. And what do you think they gave me? These lines inscribed on a plaque. And I was so touched because those lines had crossed the boundary of the divide. It had crossed the boundary of esoteric language and simple thought. It had gone to the crux. And if you all think of the Bible or the Quran or the Guru Granth, or if you think of the new of anything, the language of simplicity is the language that speaks. Or for me, whether I think of Kabir, or whether I think of Fez, or whether I think of Shakespeare, or whether I think of Keats, or whether I think of Abhayar, or whether I think of Bhartiyar, or my poets in Tamil, everyone is written simply clear and to the point. And their words linger in your mind, whether it's the Buddha's Jataka tales, or the Panchatantra tales, or the Aesop's fables, you have to go to them to understand that real wisdom comes in very simple language, we are not wise, but we at least must try and be wise. And at least take our words in the simplest form to people. So I think culture and democracy is just a sketch. I don't know till when we are here, but please ask questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, should I take a few questions? Oh, yeah. 